Good morning. It is 10 o'clock Eastern. I'm Ana Cabrera reporting from New York, and we begin with the potential third criminal indictment that could come as soon as today for former President Donald Trump. The grand jury tasked by the special counsel to hear evidence on election interference is expected to convene in Washington behind those doors. And there's more news about that investigation today, including that Bernard Carrick, the former New York City police commissioner, turned over thousands of pages of documents. Now, he had worked with Rudy Giuliani in an effort to uncover voter fraud. That's how he fits into this. Joining us now, NBC News correspondent Garrett Hake, Ryan Riley, who is standing by outside that D.C. courthouse, Jill Weinbanks, former Watergate assistant special prosecutor, and Michael Zeldin, former federal prosecutor. Thank you all for being here with us. Ryan, do we know what time the grand jury will meet today and what's on their agenda? You know, typically they've met on Tuesdays and Thursdays and start, you know, sometime around now in the morning. Um, and so we're basically just on a little bit of watch right here. But remember, this courthouse has a lot of entrances to it. And as we've uh, heard from our colleague Andrew Weissman, there is a lot of ways they can sort of go about bringing in a grand jury through a different way. They've done that with witnesses. We've seen witnesses brought in through the garage. So, you know, you're really talking about multiple entrances here, um, a third floor that's uh, sequ uh, sequestered. Uh, there are just ways for them to bring in uh, grand jurors through back entrances and back elevators. So, you know, it's I think they're going to be working probably pretty hard to try to keep the, you know, large group of media that is now at the courthouse from finding out uh, what exactly is going on behind the scenes. But Tuesdays and Thursdays are the day where the grand jury is meeting. And there's just a lot of signs pointing to uh, them being in the final stages of this investigation here. Garrett, what more do we know about Bernie Carrick and these documents, thousands of pages turned over to the special counsel's office? Well, Kirk tweeted a little bit about this yesterday. He said that this was pursuant to a subpoena that he handed over these documents, and it comes after a privilege review uh, by the Trump campaign. He makes it pretty clear that he wasn't flipping or selling out his former colleague, Rudy Giuliani. But we know that uh, Carrick and Giuliani worked together on behalf of the Trump campaign to investigate claims of voter fraud around the country. We understand these documents to be some of that work product of what they put together. So depending on what's in them, it could cast some light on what the Trump campaign and what Donald Trump himself knew about the claims he was making about voter fraud at the time. You know, how many times have we talked about this idea of whether Donald Trump knew at the time that the claims he were making were false or not? What's in these documents could shed significant light on that. So, Jill, if Carrick was involved with the Giuliani efforts to try to uncover election fraud that could change the outcome of the election, where does his testimony and evidence fit into the potential charges that we know are at least front and center in the special counsel's target letter? Anna, I think Garrett was correct. It shows probably that they found nothing. That is what we know they did because they didn't present any evidence to any court or to any public forum. So they obviously found none. So this would eliminate the possibility that at trial you were surprised by some evidence that there was fraud that had been discovered that would have justified anything that Donald Trump did. Of course, nothing justifies asking for your uh, your people to pressure Mike Pence or to pressure state legislatures or to storm the Capitol. So even if there was some kind of fraud discovered, that wouldn't justify those criminal acts. But I really think that it's going to show support for the fact that there was no evidence and that Donald Trump knew exactly that he was lying to the public and to his supporters. Michael, let's talk about the logistics of how this usually works. The special counsel already sent Trump that target letter. It sounds like that happened before prosecutors have gone through all the evidence, before Carrick is interviewed. How do you make sense of that? Well, I think they're T crossing and I dotting. I think that this Carrick evidence is not really new evidence. It was presented in the Rudy Giuliani DC bar disbarment hearings and the D.C. Bar uh, Committee looked at the cleric documents and said that they're meaningless. They have no probative value and didn't take them into account in determining that Giuliani should have his law license revoked. So I think that what we're seeing here is the last stages of the investigation where Smith is trying to make sure everything is buttoned down before he returns his indictment, which could be today.
And so, Joe, we also learned that former Justice Department official Richard Donahue has been interviewed by the special counsel's office. We already have a bit of an idea of what Donahue would say because he spoke before the House January 6th Select Committee. Let's listen. Let's take a look at another one of your notes. Uh, you also noted that Mr. Rosen said to Mr. Trump, quote, DOJ can't and won't snap its fingers and change the outcome of the election. H how did the president respond to that, sir? He responded very quickly and said, essentially, uh, that's not what I'm asking you to do. What I'm just asking you to do is just say it was corrupt and leave the rest to me and the Republican congressman. Jill, we heard him connect the dots directly to the former president. He talked to the special counsel, but he hasn't gone before the grand jury, we are told, should he? It doesn't have to be. He testified under oath already, and that's enough to have what is necessary for him to testify at a trial. And, you know, you take a risk when you have someone who's already testified under oath testify a second time. It is almost inevitable the people telling the truth will change the words. They may have some differences in recollection. And that's grounds for cross-examination by the defense. If he doesn't testify again, then they only have the one version. The thing you have to watch out for is if he repeats exactly the same thing, then you usually are suspicious that someone hmm. is lying hmm. because only liars have a sort of script and repeat the exact same thing both times. So it's really not necessary. They have him under oath. They can talk to him in the office, um, and that's how it probably will be. His testimony is very persuasive. Ryan, you just reported on another January 6th rioter being sentenced. We have video of him on January 6th. That man there seen hitting officers with a flagpole will face four years now behind bars. Where does the broader January 6th investigation stand right now? You know, frankly, we're just about coming out of halftime. Very early on, we had an FBI official say that they were in the first quarter of this, and that was in January uh, 2021. Uh, but really, you're talking about a five-year statute of limitations, and we've seen about 1,000 arrests, more than 1,000 arrests thus far. But Online Sleuths have been able to identify 3,000 people who could face charges that day, meaning that they, individuals who either entered the U.S. Capitol um, or who committed some sort of crime outside of the Capitol. Uh, what the Justice Department has been preparing the court behind me for is to have have about another thousand cases uh, come forward. So, you know, we're over two and a half years in now. So that's basically the halfway point. There are a limited handful of exceptions for some crimes that you could extend past then. But overall, the statute of limitations is going to be five years. So really, we could expect these cases uh, to be rolling in until uh, 20, early 2026. 20, uh, that is unless Donald Trump uh, comes back into office and has made clear that he's going to be uh, issuing a lot of pardons uh, to individuals who storm the Capitol. So obviously, that would have a huge impact on uh, these investigations. There have also been some other uh, Republican candidates who suggested that they may look closely at how these cases um, are being handled and either issue some pardons or, or some sort of measures there to sort of roll back the investigation. But if this continues at the pace it's going now, expect to see around 2,000 cases by the end of this, which is about two-thirds of the total number of people who could be charged. Incredible that already more than 1,000 have been arrested, hundreds already sentenced, and, and yet they're not done. We know that this investigation, the DOJ sort of approached it from the start wide and worked their way to the top. So going after all those people who were part of storming the Capitol. Meanwhile, you have then this one chunk that was broken off for the special counsel involving the former president himself. And Michael, the criminal statutes referenced in the target letter to Trump by the special counsel's office. We're talking deprivation of rights under color of law, conspiracy to defraud the U.S., and witness tampering. Tampering. Those do not include charges directly connected to the violence on January 6th. No incitement of an insurrection, no seditious conspiracy that we saw some members of the Oath Keepers and Proud Boys face. Does that surprise you? Well, it's very difficult, I think, to link Donald Trump directly to the insurrectionist activity. And I think that Smith is being very careful not to indict on charges that will be politically pregnant with all sorts of problems for him. I think he's staying closer to what is more traditional blocking and tackling for a prosecutor, obstruction of justice, conspiracy to interfere with the election, conspiracy to defraud the United States. Those are cases that are 
really straightforward legal cases. Yes, it's the former president of the United States, but these types of cases are brought every day in federal courts around the country. They're not political cases. They're normal defrauding the government types of cases. I think he's much better off staying closer to that line of approach than the insurrection case would involve for him. Garrett, Trump has been lashing out against the special counsel for days now. Quickly, if you will, where's he today? Yeah, I, and I expect that'll continue both on social media and in his fundraising appeals to supporters. He is raising money today in New Orleans at kind of a more traditional campaign style fundraiser. And Anna, he'll be on the trail in Iowa towards the end of the week trying to fit in campaign events around expected legal events is a challenge for this campaign now and one that's likely only to continue to grow. Garrett Haig, Ryan Riley, Jill Weinbanks and Michael Zeldin. Thank you all so much for that conversation. And